Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and I'll just cut to the chase. The specs on the Panasonic GH5 are so good that even though I'm a Sony shooter, I might have to get one. And maybe some uh, uber tasty glass, like his 42.5 millimeter f1.2 Noctocron and the 12 millimeter f1.4 Sumilux, the 24 uh, millimeter full frame equivalent of my favorite wide angle focal length. Because it makes no sense to chase those codecs, bit rates, and color depth unless you have lenses to match. Of course, like everybody else, I'd have to try it out, uh, the whole kit, first. And have a compelling reason for dropping something like five grand for a second system with just two lenses in focal length I basically already have, when that money could go a very long way toward Sony or Zeiss glass in focal lengths I don't have, an E-mount image stabilized body I don't have, or plane tickets I don't have. But the GH5 and its little cousin the GX85, which I named 2016 Camera of the Year, have really piqued my interest. I just have to get over three things in particular I worry about if I go micro four thirds. Noise, lens selection, I know, I know, hold that thought, adapted lenses, yada, yada, and autofocus performance. Because I just don't see how any micro four thirds system will be able to match my A6300 sensor and autofocusing capabilities. So let's call this episode one of a three part series I'll call The GH5 Has Me Thinking. And for this episode, let's focus on sensor noise. Let's do that by taking the novel approach of listening for a minute or two to this scene from the 1996 Hollywood blockbuster, The Rock. Stay with me now, stay with me. Uh, by the way, if you have Netflix or Blu-ray, wait to watch The Rock after you finish this episode, okay? All right. Pay special attention to story, dialogue, sound design, sound effects, pacing, and uh, yeah, acting. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with The Rock, or who don't immediately recognize the following scene, let me uh, set it up for you. Rogue Marines are threatening to launch VX gas rockets against the population of San Francisco unless their demands are met. It's more nuanced than it sounds. It's better than that sounds. The missiles are staged on Alcatraz, where tourists, yes, it's now a tourist spot, have been taken hostage. Nicholas Cage is chemical weapons expert and first-time FBI field agent Goodspeed. Sean Connery is British spy Mason, disavowed by his own government and imprisoned for decades without trial in the U.S. Never mind the why. Uh, it's not uninteresting, but not relevant for now. What's important is that Mason once escaped Alcatraz when it was still a prison before being recaptured. In the movie, uh, he's the only one ever to have actually made a successful escape. With the threat of tens or even hundreds of thousands of people dying horrible deaths, FBI Director Womack, against his better judgment, springs Mason from an even higher security prison to help Goodspeed and a Navy SEAL insertion team get back inside Alcatraz to overpower the rogue Marines and disarm the rockets. Here's where the scene picks up. Mason has gotten them in via the same underwater route he used to escape, but the entire SEAL team has just been killed in an ambush. Only Goodspeed and Mason have survived and escaped, for now, undetected. Goodspeed desperately wants to complete the mission, especially since his pregnant girlfriend and future wife has flown into San Francisco to be with him on what they thought was to be a training exercise. All Mason wants to do is escape. Again. 
FBI Director Womack and West Coast FBI Special Agent in Charge Paxton follow the action via encrypted radio. We get to see it. Well, you not yet. Anyway, that's the setup. Here we go. I'll watch while you listen. We got some movement. Who? Two of them. Who is it? Eagles 11 and 12. It's Goodspeed and Mason. I knew it. I've got to get a team together right now. We've got to move with the second option. What? And invite another massacre? No way. We've got a 60-year-old convict and a lab rat. I'm telling you, it's over. Not for Mason, it isn't. I'm not going to kill you. Where are you going? Off this bloody island. What? What, 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 what for? Who are you? Sir? What's the status? Status is they're dead. They're dead! It's just me and Mason. Now he says he's leaving. That is unacceptable. Do you hear me? Unacceptable. Well, there's a problem, sir. He's got a gun. What do you have, a fucking water pistol? No, sir. Go after him and stop him. I really like this movie, but it's okay if you don't. I understand. I stopped the full HD movie I was watching on my 27-inch Retina 5K iMac in full screen mode and simply did a couple of screen grabs. But here's the point. Compared to our expectations for almost any new camera today, the noise in this $75 million budget movie is atrocious. In other words, is noise really an issue for the GH5 when I already know, after playing with the GX85, that even that little guy's noise levels are better than what we just saw in a Hollywood blockbuster? Okay. You can argue that there's something organic and pleasing to the grain structure of this film. Uh, this was actually shot using at least three different Eastman emulsions, according to IMDb Pro, none rated higher than ISO 500, uh, on an Ariflex uh, 35.3 with Panavision lenses, by the way. Uh, or you can argue that expectations evolve, and I might agree with you, except if I didn't have noise on the brain, I wouldn't have noticed the noise at all. Now, I shot this episode, or I'm shooting this episode, with a $998 Sony a6300 with a $448 Sony FE 28mm f2 wide open at ISO 1600. You can argue that my scene is uh, not apples to apples with Nick Cage's, and I might agree with you again, but I think that's really a... Uh, a forest for the trees kind of reaction. Because the bigger point is this. From where I sit, the capture technology available to almost anyone today is arguably superior to the very best, available only to the few, just 20 years ago. And really, if it was good enough for those guys then, how can we enthusiasts and semi-pros demand even more now? Shouldn't we be spending more time and money on other things? Now, of course, you can make another argument, which is, if what I get out of the A6300 is this good, do I really need any more? Would I actually need a GH5? To which I can only say, darn you, darn you, you make a really good point. Let me provide some additional context. Uh, last year, I compared the low-light performance of Sony's FS5, uh, A6300, and RX10 Mark III using my favorite local landmark, the Colonial Theater. Now, you may recognize it from its starring role in that wonderful 1950s B sci-fi classic, The Blob. Uh, I'll put a link into the video in the more section below. Uh, the bottom line back then. I was stunned by how well the little 1-inch Exmor R, RS sensor in the RX-10 III kept up with the big boys and was usable up to 6400. 
though both APS-C sensors were clearly superior and the A6300 easily the cleanest of them all. I've been thinking the GH5's high ISO performance won't be nearly as clean as the A6300 for two reasons. One, the Micro Four Thirds sensor is smaller, and two, Sony is unlikely to give them the very latest tech and risk cannibalizing their own camera division's sales. But I've also been thinking that the GH5's sensor is bigger than the RX10 III's. If the GH5 is just as good as the RX10 in low light, or even better if the sensor has Sony's latest technology, I'm comfortable that high ISO noise in the GH5 would no longer be an impediment to buying it. Especially if we then take the time to light our scenes with just the tiniest fraction of skill employed by the folks who brought us the rock. I guess we'll see uh, soon enough, won't we? Well, uh, that's all for episode one. Episode two will be about lenses. If you like what you've seen, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, support our work by using our affiliate links below. I really appreciate it. And join the conversation. As always, I learned so much from you guys and I really enjoy the give and take. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.